Good evening, and welcome to the pastor's study here at Covenant Community Church. I'm Dr. Wallace McLaughlin, the pastor here at the church. We're so excited and glad that you're joining us this evening, especially during Holy Week, as we reflect on the suffering and shame of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ as he prepares to go to the cross. And we want to study God's word to enable us and empower us for the living of these days. Let us go to the Lord in a word of prayer. Gracious and eternal God, the hour has come and now is that they that believe in thee, that worship thee, must worship thee in spirit and truth. And to go imbue us with your presence and your purpose and your power. And reveal to us the bread of life, the spoken word, that it may change our lives encourage us and give us power and courage and wisdom for the living of these days, particularly these difficult days. Use me, bless those who are hearers, and pray to God that if there's anyone under the sound of my voice who do not know thee in the pardoning of their sins as Lord and Savior, that they may be convicted by your word and must cry out, Lord, what must I do to be saved? Use me, Bless the word. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good. We're excited about the word of God today. And I told you on last Sunday, if you listen to our worship uh, service, and I pray that you go uh, back and listen to the worship services that was uh, is now posted on our web page. But again, we are very uh, aware uh, that we're living in difficult days and difficult times. And we do believe, and I'm excited about uh that there's a word from the Lord. I think if there's anything uh, that I'm excited about in these uh, difficult and challenging days is that God does have a word for us, a word that will enable us and empower us to live and face uh, with courage and conviction of these days and with a sense of hope. And for someone who do not know this, the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, I invite you to join with us and listen and just dig a little deeper because I don't know how anyone can make it today without a hope in the saving grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We're living in difficult times and I would almost liken it to a war. Even the president said this is a war, but I believe it's also a spiritual war. Uh, the darkness of evil and the powers uh, that would have us to be fearful and anxious, uh, but uh, God is always uh, in charge. In this spiritual war in which we find ourselves, uh, there's no greater weapon at our disposal as, than prayer. I shared this with one of my sermons, and when we were talking about God's uh, vaccine for anxiety is prayer. And so we want to go a little deeper about prayer today because it's also we want to be reflective and thoughtful that Jesus, as he, uh, as we celebrate Holy Week, uh, that Jesus will be going to the Garden of Gethsemane and he asked the disciples there with them and he asked them uh, that they would pray with him. It was a very crucial hour, a very difficult time. And then he found them asleep and uh, he could ask, could you not have stayed awake and uh, prayed with me and been there with me? And their uh, spirit, I'm sure, was willing, but the flesh was weak and they uh, did not uh, hang in there with him. And so... We need prayer, and we have resources of heaven at our disposal, and we have the opportunity to tap into them every time we pray. This week's text, uh, and I pray that you uh, get prepared and have your Bibles with you and are ready to turn to the text. Uh, we will see what wartime prayer looks like, uh, and because this uh, title for this message from the book of Psalm, Psalm 20, uh, is wartime prayer because not only do we need prayer, but we need a wartime prayer. I'm re mindful of the movie War Room, uh, and she would always uh, go into her war room in prayer. You need a, a war room in your home, a place to go to pray, uh, but you also need a specific prayer. I, I like to think of it as a wartime prayer uh, because we're into battle. Uh, just a background and context is that before David and the Israelites headed off into battle, uh, they spent time in prayer asking the Lord for protection, help, and deliverance from their enemies. 
uh, they prayed, and this is very important that I want you to understand, why this prayer, a kind of a model prayer that would be helpful for all of us uh, during these days, they prayed with expectant faith, believing that God would be faithful to his promises towards them. Uh, let me say that again. They prayed with expectant faith, believing that God would be faithful to his promises towards him. And as we look at their prayer to God, we will see uh, some of the characteristics of their prayer. The characteristics of a prayer warrior, what are you ought to include in your prayer? Uh, and in this spiritual war that we are in now, these difficult days and the challenges we are faced, we certainly need God's help. And we must be a people who are fervent uh, in prayer. James says the, uh, the fervent prayer. James says the fervent prayer of the righteous availeth much. Now, let's go to our test. And we're going to go uh, little by little and just kind of... Uh, exegete the text as best as we can for our understanding. Psalm 20. And let's read verses 1 through 4. Uh, then we'll read the concluding verses down to verse 9. Uh, and I'm reading from the New Revised Standard uh, Version, Psalm 20. Uh, one caption it says here, a prayer uh, for victory. And that's what we need, victories. Here, uh, a Psalm of David. The Lord answer you in the day of trouble. The name of the God of Jacob protect you. May he send you help from the sanctuary and give you support from Zion. May he remember all your offerings and regard with favor your burnt sacrifices. Salah. May he grant you you your heart's desires and fulfill all your plans now we need to uh, unpack this a little uh, in these first four verses we see the people's prayer to god it's the people's prayer to god they are praying for their king to be delivered or saved from or as i would prefer to say that their king will be protected uh, now, you wouldn't know necessarily that it is the king that this uh, unidentified group of people is praying for, but they are praying for the king. Uh, but you do get the sense that they are praying, first of all, they say, the Lord hear, the name defend, send and strengthen, remember, accept, grant and fulfill. All of these verbs and the way they are stated alert us to the fact that they have been spoken as a prayer. Uh, is, this is their request to send and strengthen and to name and to hear. Uh, and they have been directed uh, that the Lord in the name of the God has been directed. We're going to get to this in a second. And this prayer request is being directed to the Lord and the name of the God of Jacob. Uh, and these two descriptors point to the same as that being, the one living and true God, uh, the God of the name of the God of Jacob uh, protect you. The Lord answer you. And all of that has been directed to God, but we're going to impact that. What does that mean? So it is a prayer, and like it could be our prayer. Now, this is important. Uh, uh, on be whose behalf are these people praying and making their requests? And if we look at the pronouns being used in verse, uh, 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 been used, it says, the. Four times in Psalms 1 and 2, it says thee twice in Psalms and verse 3, uh, the thee, thine, and thy in 4. The requests are being made on behalf of someone, not multiple someones, just one someone. Uh, and I've already let the cat out of the bag and told you that the prayers have been offered for the king of Israel. Now, this is going to be important if we're going to talk about this. Uh, and, but this becomes very clear in the next few verses, and then we'll turn to them shortly. And so there are a number of requests, but they've been made, they're praying, but they've been made on behalf uh, of the king. Now, look, look at verse 1. It says, the Lord answer you in the day of trouble. Uh, this phrase, in the day of trouble, or could also mean in the day of distress. 
and it appears over a dozen times in the Old Testament. Uh, and, and in several of those instances in Old Testament, it is speaking of the invasion of a foreign army. And I think that's the point here. The king is going into some military skirmish, whether, whether to aggressively attack the enemy and gain ground or to defend his nation from an invading enemy. And the people are asking God to answer him as he leads the army in battle. Uh, this is important. They're praying for the king because the king is going into battle. And so Psalms 21, the second line, uh, then they ask, so what will the king likely be asking for in battle? The second line or a statement of Psalm 21, ask the Lord uh, to the Lord answer you, defend you in the day of trouble. In the battle to come, the, that king will certainly himself be asking the Lord for defense. Uh, and the word there for defense has the idea of setting something uh, in a high place to defend the idea of security. And so the picture is that he uh, would get out of the way of danger. And, and I thought about this. And so when we talk about, it says the Lord answer you in the day of trouble and the name of the God of Jacob will protect you or defend you. And I like to think about it. When we think about uh, who God is and the characteristics of the God we serve, the name of the God, the God of, uh, we're going to come back later, but the name of the God of Jacob protect you, defend you. So God's name is also a defending name. And they're praying that uh, for the king that, uh, the Lord will defend him, will protect him, and to set him up on high. Now, it's not necessarily that the king will be set up on a mountain. It's probably more figuratively asking that the king will be protected from danger because a lot of the kings would also go into battle with their troops. They wouldn't just send the troops in and say, well, I'm going to hide out here in this skirmish and y'all go, and so set him up on high. No, it's still saying figuratively that he will be set up on high and protected and that God's name is the defending name that he will set us up on high. This is very important because in battle, God, for those of us who are believers, God will set us up on high. And often when we come to Jesus Christ, even in Colossians, the third chapter, it says, and this is an appropriate time during this Easter season, because it says, if ye, then in Colossians 3, verses, I think, 1 through 3, it says, if ye, then be risen from Christ. If you've been risen from Christ, and the command in the Greek word if means that you have, if you accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, if you've been risen with Christ, then seek. Those things. It goes on to talk about C. But then it also says to set your affections on the things above. So that's not meaning you go out and go jump on top of a building and set your uh, affections on things above, like it was not telling the king that, but to set your mindset, your Christ consciousness on the things above. And that's how God defends us. So we have to get our minds sometimes out of the pity part or out of the gutter from down looking below and set it up on high. And then God will defend us. That God will because our, we will have a Christ consciousness. I was just thinking about it. Well, what I'm trying to say, let me give a physical example. One thing, if you stand on the ground and see a lion, you probably get scared because it's a big, ferocious lion. But I bet if you were standing on a 10-story tall building and you looked at the lion, the lion don't look so bad. It's a different perspective that if we set our mind up on high, if we raise our Christ consciousness and to think the things and seek after the things that are of Christ, then God defends us because our mindset is up on high. And that's, they're asking uh, that God the Lord would defend and protect them and to set his in a high place, in a place of uh, consciousness. And then it's also interesting, I, I like this and I get excited about it because then we're praying and when you pray for victory, uh, the Lord answer you in the day of trouble. Uh, the name of the God of Jacob protect you, defend you. Now, this is very interesting because when it says the name of the God of Jacob. In the Hebrew, the word name expresses a different concept in the sense that in terms of how we uh, uh, think of 
uh, of name. Uh, we used to think about a name. If we think about somebody, you're just calling them by their name, Bob, John, Larry, Sue, and Mary. And that's basically maybe all we're doing. But in the Hebrew, uh, the name, it really uh, did more. It tells you something about the character of that person. And, and, and that's, that's uh, um, in line with uh, old times and our ancestors. When we named children, uh, the name meant something. It was named after a person with some character. Um, I, when uh, we were blessed uh, with our son, and we were thinking of a name, and one of the, the his first name I wanted to give him uh, was after my uncle, uh, and his middle name after uh, his grandfather, uh, Carlos' uh, father. And both strong characteristic, uh, character. And so it was something about the name Jackson uh, that meant a lot to me that would imbue a sense of character the same as what my uncle did. He was a, a steward, an uh, officer in the church, a faithful man of God, a carpenter, uh, well-respected in the community, and a, a strong man, and uh, as well as a his father. And so when we gave him that name, it imbued a sense of strength. And I know that if he has that name, there are some things that we're expecting from him in that name. So when they used it, they, when they pray, and when you and I pray, the name of the God of Jacob protect you. One, you're not praying to an unknown God. You're praying to a God that you know who that God is. One, and they must have known that God because of his characteristics would be able to uh, defend him because one of the promises that God had made in terms of uh, that he would keep a, a Davidic king on the throne forever. But also notice this. I, I, I get excited by this. It's that the name of the God of Jacob. Help will come from the God of Jacob. Well, why is this important? Well, because I, I, because God richly, catch this now, God richly blessed Jacob. And Jacob didn't do a thing to deserve any of it. Mm, I got excited about that. Because when I pray to the God of Jacob, that God, it, it says to me that God will answer me as he answered these people in their prayer and they're praying that, that God will protect their king, the God of Jacob. Because if God blessed Jacob and Jacob didn't do anything to deserve it. Jacob, if you know, was a trickster. Jacob was a supplanter. Jacob uh, was just a deceiver. He deceived his brother Esau, and he, he stole the birthright from him, and, and he was a conning man, and he had a lot of flaws. He had a checkered past, like men of you and I, and yet he was blessed. Now, you go later on in Genesis 32, and that he was blessed and wrestled with the angel uh, all night, and he had a, 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 a halt and a limp in his, the hollow of his thigh, something that he would always remember uh, for the rest of his life. But then his name was changed, and he was blessed in spite of who he was. That's the kind of God that we serve when we pray. We know we pray into a God. Another way of saying that he looks beyond our faults and he sees our needs. So he prays. But the other thing about it, he prays in the name of the God of Jacob to defend it. He's praying because this God, this is a very important, this God stands ready to help us with those same blessings if we are like Jacob, uh, what do you mean, Pastor? If we are like Jacob, desperate for the son's inheritance, for what God would do for us. If we are desperate, Jacob wrestled with the angel all night long. I, I had a sermon one time I called all night long. Well, no, I, maybe I took it from uh, Lionel Richie. He had a song on one of his albums, All Night Long. Well, he was talking about partying all night long. Uh, th that's not what I'm talking about. I'm, talking, I'm not talking about partying all night long. I'm talking about wrestling all night long with God for a blessing because you believe in this God and that God is going to 
help you and bless you. And you're, gonna, you're not going to give up. You, you're not going to throw in the towel, no matter what people say, no matter what the circumstances, no matter what you're going through. You, you're going you're to hang in there. You're going to continue to pray. And then I noticed something else. In the second verse, I, I say, it said, may he send you help from the sanctuary and give you support from Zion. The people still asking God to protect their king. But this time, catch this, this is important too. This time, they're focusing on the location from which God will protect the king. They ask that God send help to the king from his sanctuary, literally from his holy uh, or like a holy place. And that's why sanctuary makes sense. In, in, in other words, from his command post. Uh, the president, as he uh, uh, attempts to deal with uh, the COVID virus in our nation today, has a task force. And they meet in the war room. There's a command center where they meet. And this is where we're hoping, at least from the government, uh, from the federal government, if it, it, it comes, it will come from, it will emanate from the command center, from that place. And this is where people are crying out for help. It must come from the command center. And that's why in this test, it says, may he send you help from the sanctuary, from God's command center. This is very important because this text says to us, and as believers, support comes only from Zion. That's where the king lives. That's where the temple is. All our resources come from the house of God. It's not this world that we need. It's the treasures of heaven. We may even lose those things in this world in our struggles against the enemy. But God fills us with his inheritance as a replacement. Now, some of us are going to lose things. Some and many as they have are going to lose jobs. Uh, some as many are going to lose a significant amount in our retirement accounts. Some and uh, many are are going to lose loved ones. We've already lost over 10,000 and the numbers are expected to climb. We may even lose these things in our struggle against the enemy. We hear this, but God fills us with his inheritance as a replacement. And that's why it's something that Paul considered far more valuable than any trouble he had to go through by comparison. In my message this past Sunday, this too shall pass, and I encourage you to go back and listen to it. And I close with Paul's epistle to the second Corinthians chapter four, verses 16 through 18. And he said, oh, this affliction we're going through, this is temporary. And that's why I said it, 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 it too will pass. This affliction we're going through, it does not compare to the glorious inheritance that we have in Christ Jesus. That even though we may lose things, it still does not compare to what Christ has to offer us. Quickly, then also then, verse 3. May he, uh, this is it, uh, well, they're all important. I keep saying it's important. But may he remember all your offerings May he remember all your offerings and regard with favor your burnt sacrifices. The people ask that the king's religious devotion to the Lord would be accepted. That the Lord would remember and accept all the times when the king had offered an offering according to God's rules. My, 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 my. This is what they're praying. That they, this is a public prayer, and they're praying on behalf of the king that 
the Lord would remember and accept all the times when the king had offered an offering according to God's rules. Now, I admit, now, for some of you uh, go running with your thoughts, that sometimes the thought of God answering someone because of what that person does can be uncomfortable. I mean, we're rightly taught that salvation is by grace through faith. It's not because of what we do. Uh, it doesn't happen through our works. We're not saved by our works, but because we are saved, we are to demonstrate our good works. But there, and there are scriptures, uh, particularly in the Old Testament. Let me just bring it to you. Uh, there are different examples. Uh, we need to keep in mind that the Lord actually has answered the prayers of people, apparently uh, based on their deeds. And one I'm just going to reference because you may be familiar with it. I'm just going to reference uh, one in the Old Testament. You have uh, heard of Hezekiah in 2 Kings 20. Remember, he was sick and Isaiah the prophet came to him and told him that he would die. Do you uh, remember how Hezekiah responded? Uh, he turned uh, to the wall and prayed to the Lord. And he said this, I beseech you, O Lord, re remember now how I have walked before thee in truth and with a perfect heart and have done that which is good in thy sight. And let me just stop for a second because... I don't want somebody to get uh, thinking and say, well, that doesn't apply to me because I don't have a perfect heart. But even Paul talks about that in the, uh, the book of uh, James, I believe, about having a perfect heart uh, somewhere in the, in the epistles. Uh, but perfect there also means just really mature, one maturing uh, in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, that we're to mature. Uh, and live out and be all that God has called us to be. Not perfect in the sense that you never make a mistake, you never do anything, but a mature heart. Uh, and the Lord heard him and healed him. Hezekiah pointed the Lord to his good deeds and his following the Lord in order to appeal to him to answer his prayers. So I just point this out to say that while you can't point to your works in order to appeal to the Lord to save you, the people in this psalm, have some precedent to beseech the Lord to protect their king in part because of his acts of genuine devotion to the Lord. And you, if you also look at some New Testament scriptures and from James 1, 25, and it talks about how the Lord will reward those who are faithful to uh, uh, his deeds and uh, other tests. And then sometimes the reward, how the Lord God will reward us when we're faithful is our glorious inheritance. And sometimes that inheritance, uh, what we, our reward may not be on this side, it may be on the other side. And verse four, but, and, and, and I would have to stop and ask you, have you been faithful uh, to the Lord in your worship? your service, your study, and your giving. And sometimes we pray and want the Lord to do uh, something for us. Uh, but this test, in particular, Hezekiah, shows that the Lord healed him and answered their prayers. And part of it, I don't know if all of it, but part of it was because they also think about how he's been faithful and devoted to you, O Lord. And then verse 4. May he grant you your heart's desires and fill you with your, fulfill all your plans. The people praying that God would give the king anything he desired and that God would bring all his plans to pass. In the contest, I would imagine they're asking specifically for the king's battle plans to uh, succeed. But also be mindful uh, that our plans must line up with the plan of God. It is not willy-nilly that whatever you are asking for that God is going to give, but their plan that they will fulfill all the desires of his heart and his plan, uh, uh, particularly in battle. And then verse 5 and 6. 
It says, may we shout for joy over your victory and in the name of our God, set up our banners and may the Lord fulfill all your petitions. Uh, this is how they're saying, this is how we're going to uh, plan, uh, uh, respond. The people state their plan to rejoice when the Lord protect their king. Uh, they are shout for joy when it happens. Uh, and then they go on to state in uh, Psalm uh, verse 5 that they plan to set up their banners uh, just like an army does. Uh, and an army has a banner. Uh, but whatever the case, these people will set up their banners in the name of the God and their name in which they prayed. Uh, one, it will say uh, that God will defend their king. So one, I like to think about the name of God and when we pray, excuse me, that it is a defending name. And secondly, it is a displaying name. When we pray, there needs to be a displaying name. Uh, the defending name is the Lord God, God of Jacob. And the de displaying name, we're going to uh, uh, display our banners. We're going to set up our banner. And uh, in the, the Old Testament, Deuteronomy, Moses talks about this, of uh, the displaying name. Uh, I've talked in one of our Bible studies that God is also, the characteristics of God is that he's Jehovah Nisi, uh, a displaying God. And, and, and what that uh, 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 means is that we got to display and let the world know uh, who authorship, authority ship we're under. Uh, it, it, when I was in Air Force, we would have our flag and a banner that people know we were in the uh, Air Force. But as a Christian, you ought to raise your banner and let people know that all that you have, all that who you are, and all what you do is in the name of the Lord, that you're alive and that you're still here and that you're making it by God's grace. And so you got to ought to display it, uh, the sign that says, praise the Lord and give God praise and let a dying world know that we're going to display the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And, and so he gets to the, the verse 6. And here's what I, I, and I like, because it takes a, 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 a shift because you're praying. And, and I think this is very important for our prayer life because uh, this is very important. In verse 6, it says, now I know. Now, Originally, it, it, it amazes, it, they, it was the public and the people were praying and they was talking about we, now the pronoun, pronoun shifts. It says, now I know that the Lord will help his anointed. He will answer him from his holy heaven with mighty victories by his right hand. Now I know. So even when you pray, you got to pray. And Mark says in the gospel of Mark, one thing about the successful prayer, you have to pray and believe. Because it says they are praying this, but then now it's a, it's a statement of affirmation. And, and a lot of times we just pray and we just wonder, well, I hope the Lord hear me. I don't know. Maybe so he'll help me. I'm not for sure. But you got to declare with, with power and conviction that your prayers has been answered. And you got to walk in it. Because it says in verse 6, now I know that the Lord will help his anointed. He will answer him from his holy heaven with the mighty victories of his right hand. And I like this. And early in the verse two, it says that may, may the Lord send you help from the sanctuary. But, <clears throat> but now it is saying, now that I know that the Lord will help his anointed and he will answer him from his holy heaven. And so what I, I really want you to know, and I said a couple of sermons ago, it, it, church won't save you. Now, I know that's the command station, but it's still about your personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And they said that he will answer them from help come from the sanctuary. But then in verse six, he said he will answer him from his holy heaven. You got to have a hookup and you got to have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. You can be in church that doesn't mean church is in you. You got to have a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ because it may start in the church, but it, it emanates, it comes from heaven, from that personal relationship with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And then here's what's the practical results of this prayer. He says, some take pride in chariots and some in horses. But our pride is in the name of the Lord, our God. Some take pride in chariots and some in horses. But our pride is in the name. Well, before we criticize 
them who they're talking about don't criticize when it says some take pride in chariots and some horses well if you go into battle you're going to use some chariots and you're going to use some horses and nothing wrong with that the the the, the that's not the problem uh it, it makes sense uh you do battle with chariots and with horses those are the materials available to you but even if it might make some sense it's totally wrong and the people the king know it because I don't want to jump ahead of myself. It's, it's almost like a thought that the Lord just brought to my mind, and I've said this before. It's like having an education, but don't let the education have you. It's nothing wrong with having money. Money is our resources and materials that we need. We all need money. But don't let money have you. You see, they will certainly use chariots and horses to a great profit. If you're going to win the war and the battle, you need some horses and chariots, you need some money, you need some education, you need a job, all those things. But here, here's, 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 here's what's important. But they don't call upon those things. They don't invoke them. They, they don't put their trust in them. The king's people, in contrast to the enemy, will vote the name of the Lord. It's nothing wrong. Oh, it's nothing wrong with having money and education and fame and, and houses and lands. But don't call on them. I remember somebody said, and I, after her husband died, and he himself was a successful physician, and she said he had the best physicians, heart specialists, um, diabetes, uh, uh, doctor to work on his diabetes, his liver, and everything. He had the best. And the whole time she was talking, I was thinking to myself, but you never said he had the Lord. It's nothing wrong with having those things because even today, you may have all those things, those material and resources, and you might have amassed a lot of things. You may have books and education and degrees and money and fame and popularity, and I don't know, the list could go on and on and on and endless, but don't put your trust in them. And that's what the people are saying here, we will trust in the Lord. Those are the different characteristics. Because in Psalm 28 is the contrasting results of choosing the Lord for protection and choosing other means. It says, what happened to the enemy of Israel in the battle? Psalm, the verse 8 says, they will collapse and fall, but we shall rise and stand upright. They were brought down and they fell. Now what you want to have happen in a battle, and this is not a time to be falling in this battle we're going through. But in contrast, it says, but we, the king's people, proclaim we are risen and stand upright. Praise the Lord. Here's another thing that I found interesting as we prepare to close. I find interesting in verse 8, and there are different uh, commentaries, scholarly commentaries, and I'm going to probably go with this a scholarly uh, commentary by Professor Rolf Jacobson uh, from the Lutheran uh, Seminary. If you notice verse 9, it says, Give victory to the king, O Lord. Answer us when we call. Here's what uh, Dr. Professor Jacobson makes of the following observation that I want to share with you. He says, one of the strange poetic features of this psalm is that the poem moves forward from petition, petition to trust, as we started out in the beginning, from petition to trust, but then moves backward from trust to renewed petition. The poem ends with a petition. Even though the psalmist has just voiced soaring words of confident trust in verses 6 through 8. We just read that. But now back in verse 9, 
He's gone back and praying again. Is this change a prayerful form of spiritual backsliding? No, he says. Is this renewed petition a sign that the confident trust of verse 6 and 8 is a sham? Again, he says, no. Rather, the renewed petition is a hint of what it means to live a life of faith. Let me say that again. It's a renewed petition. If you look at the vacillation between verses 6 and 8, where it is ultimate commensurate trust and it started that going forward and praying and asking then verse 6 talks about trust and I said to declare but then it comes back in verse 9 saying praying again answer us when we call but this is a renewed petition it's a hint of what it means to live a life of faith can you think of a situation where your prayers have swung between hope that God would answer your prayer then to some sort of solid trust in God and then back to a place of needing to commit the situation to God again? Are there any situations that possibly won't be righted until eternity? Sometimes in life and on our journey, we may vacillate. That's just a part of the journey until we're called home. Uh, and maybe that's where some of you are now and I would encourage you to uh, write your course and go back to verse 6 and 8 and trust God. In this text, we saw a number of things that a wartime prayer is a prayer that calls on the defending name of God. Uh, the name of the Lord will answer you. He will answer so God hears. We know that God hears your prayers, but and he protects because he has a defending name, the name of God of uh, Jacob. He provides, and it says, may he send you help from the sanctuary. Our help and our resources come from the Lord. And for some believer who do not know these, the Lord and the Savior, or you do not have a church home as you're listening to this Bible study, I encourage you to continue to uh, tune into our Bible studies. Uh, but when all of this is over and it too shall pass to join us or join another fellowship that you can uh, be with us and study the word of God. And then it also says that uh, there's a display in name. He will uh, 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 fulfill and he will deliver. So we're going to display, we're going to tell everybody when we come out of this and how we made it, it was by the grace of God and God kept us and that God answers all of our prayers. This is a wartime prayer. I pray that you will go back and study it more intently and pray. Also, I would encourage you to pray for each other uh, using these words from Romans 15, 13, especially into tough life situations different people are facing today. I hung, when I came here as pastor, I hung a banner in the entry point of the church. As soon as you come in, there's a banner on the right-hand side of the wall uh, so that you would see it when you come and leave. And it's taken from Romans 15, 13, and it's what I will leave you as we close in prayer. And I will pray that scripture for our prayer. Let us pray. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit.